Ah. So Nikki <clears throat> brings up a, an excellent question, as opposed to her usual questions, which are terrible. No, I'm just teasing her. She said, uh, last week, you said that people always know that they have done something wrong, so we should not treat them like they're retarded by pointing it out. The example that you gave was of the child who drops a cup and breaks it, and then you know we point out to the child, you're so stupid, you know, you shouldn't have done that. She says, I acknowledge that you're correct in very many cases, and we would do very well to approach situations with real love. However, it seems to me that that is not always the case, that people see that what they are doing is hurtful to others, and that they will continue to do so until it is pointed out. I can attest to this in myself, as real love has opened my own eyes to ways that I have been wrong without realizing it for many years. You are quite right. And obviously I was making a generalization that on the whole, people realize what they're doing is wrong. And usually you can tell. For example, somebody does something wrong and then they kind of cower, they shrink or they wince. Um, they're telling you that they know that it's wrong. Then we don't need to pound them. Well, actually, we don't need to pound people ever. But we do sometimes need to point out behaviors that people persist in that are continually hurtful because they really don't see them. And Nikki continues, one example is an incident with my husband <clears throat> in which he reamed our teenage daughter up one side and down the other in a way that was completely humiliating to her and embarrassing to me, to another daughter and a guest, uh, all of whom were sitting 15, uh, who were sitting in a kitchen nearby. When I brought this up in a marriage counseling session, my husband was completely and totally oblivious to the fact that he had done this in front of anyone else until I described exactly who, when, where. I can recount many other instances where I have felt his behavior to be emotionally abusive toward me or our kids. You're right that pointing these situations out to him has not been very productive as it simply results in denying, defending, and dismissing. He is hypersensitive to anyone criticizing him, uh, but he defends his own equivalent behavior as justifiable. I honestly think he is clueless relationship retarded, if you will. It seems to me that some people should have their bad behavior pointed out to them and told that it is unacceptable in no uncertain terms. Now, this you're, you're absolutely right that some people do not recognize the behaviors that they do that are very hurtful. But it's very revealing that this last thing that you say is, it seems to me that some people should have their bad behavior pointed out to them and told that it is unacceptable in no uncertain terms. As soon as you see, that their, see their behavior as unacceptable, you're attacking them. And that is what your husband is fighting against. So <clears throat> you revealed your attitude right off. You see your husband's behavior as unacceptable, you come at him with that attitude, and he feels your attack. He feels it because you are attacking him. Now, what he's doing is wrong. You're right about that. Does it need to be pointed out? Yes. But the way you're pointing it out is wrong. Now, you have to see that before there's any chance in this world that you're going to make a difference with him. So how would you do it? <clears throat> First of all, you can't point out his behavior while he's engaged in it. So, and you didn't. Uh, if, for example, somebody is screaming at somebody, you can't in that moment come up to them and say, you know, that's unacceptable behavior to be screaming. Uh, they're going to defend themselves a mm, hundred times out of a hundred, pretty much. Uh, it'd be a fluke if you got a one time out of a hundred that they didn't. So, not a wise choice. So you wait until there's nothing stressful going on. Then you sit down with your husband and you say, George, uh, I know that you love our daughters. I know that you're doing your best to raise them so that they're happy. I know that you're trying to care for them. So am I. And there's something that you're doing with them, 
even though you do many things that are caring and loving toward them, there's something that you're doing that I don't think you realize you're doing. And if you re and the reason I say that I don't think you realize you're doing it is that if you did, because your goal is to love them, I don't think you'd keep doing it. So knowing that your interest is in loving our daughters, I don't think you would intentionally hurt them. So I'd like to point out something that you're doing that is hurting them, and I'm assuming that, it, that it's unintentional. So I want to tell you about an incident the other night. I know that when I get angry, I get a little crazy. Um, when I get angry, I don't think clearly. I often will forget later what I even said. And I'm assuming that that may be some of what's going on with you. But when you talk to our daughter, Susie, um, you made her feel pretty bad. The language you used was this. You called her a this and you called her a that. And, and you did it in front of other people. She did need to be corrected. She was wrong. You're right about that. She, she was wrong. She did need to be corrected. She needed to be guided. But the language that you used could only humiliate her and make her feel bad. And she felt so bad that she didn't hear any of the words that you were trying to tell her. So she learned nothing and only felt unloved. Now, you, you don't need to respond to this. I'm not trying to change your behavior. Now, this is important, sweetie, because if you say your behavior is unacceptable, he'll fight you. Whereas if you say, I'm not trying to change your behavior, I'm simply pointing out what happened, how it affected her, because I know that if you know that it hurt her, that you wouldn't want to keep hurting her. Do you see how different that approach is? It's huge. It assumes that he is basically good at heart. Whereas the way you're approaching it now, you're assuming that he's basically evil and that he has to be stopped. And boy, he's not going to react to that well. People don't. So think about that the next time that you talk to him. It really can make a difference. I've seen it work over and over again. Um, Sarah says, so this being wrong thing is showing up in some sibling rivalry in our home. This evening, Heather, five, was playing with Jasmine, nearly one. Heather was holding Jasmine's hands while she walked across the room. And at some point, Heather pushed Jasmine, who fell, and hit her head on the side of the bookcase. Lots of screaming then from both children followed. Jasmine was screaming because she was hurt. Heather was screaming because I'm pretty sure she realized that she'd done something wrong that had hurt her sister. I'm sure she was pretty panicked, actually. Do you have any suggestions on how to eliminate the sibling rivalry? What's the best way to handle such situations if it should ha happen again? Um, I guess I'm not seeing where the rivalry is. She was holding her hand, walking across the room. She pushed her, and she hit her head. So unless you're suggesting that she pushed her intentionally, you're going to have to help me with that. Um, I'm not seeing the, ri the, the rivalry in this. So can you help me out a little bit? Uh, if she pushed her intentionally, it's a different thing than if it was an accident. So give me a little bit more, and then I'll be able to, uh, to help you. In the meantime, let's go with Barb. Uh, <clears throat> my nine-year-old daughter does not want to play with one of her girlfriends. Let's see. Let's, uh, okay, so Sarah, are you telling me that Heather intentionally pushed Jasmine? That's what I need to know. In the meantime, while you're giving me that answer, um, it, sometimes it's hard to know whether it's intentional or not. So re the biggest thing to avoid is excitement. That's the whole reason that Heather was also screaming. 
So Heather pushes Jasmine, Jasmine falls over, hits her head, and what's obvious why Jasmine's screaming, her head got banged on the bookcase. But Heather is screaming because she's afraid of what's going to happen next. She's afraid that you're going to come down on her and say, look what you've done to your sister. And that's a natural tendency for parents to do. How could you, being five years old, and how could you do this terrible thing? And we tend to come in and say, stop it. So instead, you come in and you love and you teach. Love and teach and love and teach. And so you sit down with Heather and you say, so what happened? Well, I didn't mean to. Well, but did you mean not to? Maybe you didn't intentionally push her, but were you careful enough? She's one year old. Jasmine doesn't know how to walk. She can't walk nearly as fast as you can. And so you have to be really extra careful with a one-year-old so that that doesn't happen. For example, and I'm speaking for you, when mommy walks with Jasmine, do you ever see Jasmine fall against the bookcase? No, because I walk very slowly and I support her and hold her hand and help her so that won't happen. And if you, I love it that you walk with your sister, you just need to be a little more careful with her. And I know you can do that. Now, do you see the difference? All supportive. I know you can do that. I know that you know how to do it. You just need to be a little bit more careful and you're not in trouble. Now, if she continues to do it over and over, which I don't think is going to happen if you're loving. If you're loving, Heather's going to want to do the right thing, really. Children react and rebelliously only when they feel a sense of not being loved by us. Then they get really rebellious and cantankerous and they'll fight us just to show us that they're in a position of power. So if you're loving, it's unlikely she's going to keep doing it. Should she keep doing it, then you would have to say, well, for the rest of the day, if you can't be careful with your sister, then you won't be able to walk with her. You can't play with her because it's too dangerous to her. She needs somebody who is gentle. And so maybe tomorrow you'll be able to play with her. That would be a natural consequence. Just like if a child plays with a toy and is too rough with it and breaks it, gosh, then you won't be able to play with your toys the rest of the day. Same with a little sister but it's done gently. I know you can do this. Here's the right thing to do. I know you don't want to hurt your sister. Um, show her how it's done. Show her how to walk properly with her sister. But it's teaching and loving that you do first and you do that repeatedly. Then you move to consequences, but you never become excited. You never come in and just say, stop it. You never become irritated because that's when the child feels unloved and will act out and do it even more. In fact, she'll act out and very likely then intentionally hurt her sister and it will have been precipitated by you. So we cause a lot of the problems that we're trying to control as parents. Um, my nine-year-old daughter, this is Barb, does not want to play with one of her girlfriends anymore. This is a good decision because the girl was bullying her in a way and bossing her around and in general causing my daughter distress when she'd come home crying from school. However, the parents, um, where, where were we? It moved up on me. Oops, the parents of the girl have called for play dates and they are very nice. I don't know how to communicate the truth about my daughter not wanting to play with their child without hurting the parents' feelings. Do you have any suggestions to handle this in a real love manner? Um, if what I would what I would tell the the parents of the bullying child is just this: some parents are willing to hear something about their child; some parents are not. I think every parent deserves an opportunity to at least hear the truth. And so if a parent called me and said, 
uh, we'd like a range of play date. I would say, uh, my daughter used to feel comfortable around your daughter, but she doesn't anymore because she feels like that your daughter bullies her. And when she comes home from school, mind you, I'm not criticizing your daughter. I'm simply passing on information that you can either choose to make use of or not. I have no criticism whatever of your daughter or of you. I'm just saying that she comes home frightened, she comes home from school crying, and she says, I don't want to play with whoever it is, Sally, uh, anymore. And my experience is that kids don't make up unhappy experiences, so something is going on. And, you know, it's up to you what you want to do with that information, but she has chosen not to play with her. And so I can do nothing really but support her in, in her decision. And if the parents, you know, say, well, my daughter would never do that, which is a very common reaction, then you just say, okay, well, I, again, I was just uh, passing on information that my nine-year-old daughter gave to me, and I was just passing it on unfiltered to you, so uh, maybe she's wrong. Because you have no need to be right. Once parents tell you that they don't want to hear anything bad about their child, <laughs> you're done. I mean, ask teachers who call parents at home and try to describe horrendous classroom behavior of a child. And then the parents will come back with, my child would never do that. Uh, those parents don't want to hear anything, and they never will. So I think it's definitely worth trying to tell a parent that once. But you're not in charge of the parent, and you're not in charge of the child. Then you give up and go, oh, hey, my mistake. Maybe my daughter was wrong. But she would still prefer not to play with your daughter. So I really appreciate your calling, and uh, you're done. Um, here's Nikki, who says that I crack her up, which is, I don't know if that's good or bad. Uh, I feel like in the past I assumed my husband's goodness and good intentions, uh, and I tried to communicate in a loving way, but it still didn't go well. He still argued about the details, saying he didn't do that, he didn't say that, and whatever the child did deserved his response. Then we'd end up in a fight that I never intended. But I think you described t for me the ways that I was really not communicating what I thought in as loving a way as I intended. Nikki, sweetie, you get, uh, stop the presses and pin a gold medal on your lapel. Because this is a great example for everybody who's listening of truth telling. I mean, here Nikki is saying, you know, I've been trying to point this out to my husband and what I said to her was, but you're not pointing it out in a loving way. Um, you're pointing it out in a way that's accusing him. You're telling him that he's wrong. And Nikki, rather than saying, um, well, no, no, I, I, yes, I was doing it in a loving way. Nikki said, I'll be dang. I didn't see that before. Um, I'm not pointing it out in a loving way. As soon as you see that, you have created the power to change it. And now when you go to your husband and try it in a different way, you create an opportunity to create essentially an entirely different relationship with him. This is huge. The only person we can ever change in a relationship is us. We never get to change the other person. So Nikki, congratulations to you. Great courage. Um, Here's a man who says, Nikki, I wish that my wife had pointed out my unconscious behaviors toward her in the way that Greg just explained from the side of love, that she could have seen them as unconscious and not some evil in me. Oh, it's the way we treat people when we say that that's just not acceptable. I mean, look what that says to somebody. It says you're a monster. You are not acceptable. That's what we're really saying. Uh, he continues, I really think my desire to see my behaviors and grasp real love could have occurred with love and not from her divorcing me. Probably so. Um, 
Which of us hears well hearing our faults pointed out to us with a gun to our head? or you know, with venom spewing out of the mouth of the person talking to us, or fire from their eyes. As soon as somebody becomes irritated with us, really, all we hear is, I don't love you, and we are paralyzed. It's over. We, we can't hear a single other thing. And then after the conversation, when we're the one who's angry, we wonder, well, what is the matter with that idiot? Why couldn't they hear me? Well, turns out the idiot really is us because we were irritated and we made him deaf. So once we can see that, gosh, that changes stuff for us. I look at all the times that I wondered why the people around me couldn't listen to me and it was my fault. Sarah says, here's a truth about me being the mother of two children. Sometimes it is really challenging to know whether to comfort uh, Yasmin, that's the one-year-old who got hurt, or Heather first. I usually tend to go to Yasmin and then let Chris, the father, go to Heather. Uh, as Chris doesn't do too well comforting Yasmin, I can see that Heather must feel left out and potentially even unloved by me. Um, even though Chris and I are making great efforts to love on both children without making either one wrong. Being a big sister after four years of being the one and only is really challenging. You know, you're, you're right. Uh, and, and on some occasions, you might go and sweep up both children in your arms and love both of them at the same time for a moment or two. Um, and then assess which one of them is hurt the most. Sometimes you do have to love one child first and then another one. And it's been my experience that if the love that you give them is really genuine, it's unconditional, it's sincere, it's warm, they won't care that they had to wait a minute for it. They won't. So don't worry so much about the sequence. Um, it's more about the genuineness of it and you're going to be okay. And the fact that you're simply talking about it, the fact that you're acknowledging your need to love them better, you're well on your way. You're doing the right stuff, mama. You're, you're, you're doing great. You're going to get better and better at it simply because you're willing to tell the truth about the times that you make mistakes. So I'd, uh, I'd maybe pat myself on the back here and go, I'm getting better. I'm, I'm doing all right and your kids will bless you for it. You're, you're doing fine. Kathy says, uh, I have the same problem knowing who to give my attention to. My daughters are 13 and 12, but I have loved them conditionally for so long that both of them crave the unconditional love I'm trying to learn to give them. And they get into a competitive situation about it. Oh, of course. And so, what you have to remember is it, it's not about a competition. In fact, if they're competing with you for attention, any attention you give them while they're whining at you or clinging for it, they're not going to feel because they're on the field of death. If I come to you and I say, Kathy, love me, and I grab you by both shoulders and I pull you toward me, anything you give me is going to feel like imitation love to me because I'm taking it from you. So what you do in the situations when they're both fighting for your attention is almost irrelevant because they're going to take it as imitation love. What is going to matter most is the attention you give them when they're not asking for it. I had a mother who uh, had one of these kids who never let go of her skirt her leg, her shoes, her, I mean, this kid just stuck on her like glue. She was one of those mothers who, you know, when, when you call up on the phone, you could never have a conversation with her because this kid was squalling constantly. And I said, why does your kid cry all the time? She said, I don't know. I mean, I'm with him all the time. All I do is pay him attention. And I said, yeah, you pay him attention when he's demanding it. But you're not paying him attention when he's not. So do this. 
at the few times that he's not demanding attention, because the kid really was demanding, you go find this kid and you look into his eyes and touch him and talk to him directly, really intimately, and give him your attention for, we're only talking two minutes, five minutes, so the kid feels really connected to you. Do that 10 times a day for two minutes. I called her, I actually called me like two weeks later. And I said, so how's it going with the kid? Because I couldn't hear the kid screaming. And she said, um, I can hardly find him anymore. The attention that you give a child when it's not being demanded is worth a hundred times more than any attention you give a kid when they're begging for it. When a child's begging for it, you're on the field of death. And anything you give them is going to feel like imitation love. It's worthless. So it matters what you give unconditionally when it's not bidden, what you give freely. Uh, that's the key. So that's what I suggest you do with your daughters. You set aside time where you just go find them and just sit down with them and talk to them for no reason whatever. That perhaps once a week you say, okay, on Thursday night from 7 to 8.30, that's your time. You decide what you want to do with me for that for that particular daughter. Your time is Thursday, the other daughter's time is Wednesday or Friday or whatever it is, and for an hour and a half we're going to do whatever you want. Go out and get ice cream, watch a movie, uh, whatever it is. That's my time with you, alone, interrupted by nothing. You go out of your way to create time where they feel special, where they feel like all of your attention is focused on them. Makes a pretty big difference. See. Jill says, when you say telling in a loving way, I have trouble using it on my eldest daughter when she often found excuses for her mistakes. Consequences work well, but I find that she's taking it as a punishment. I want to love and teach uh, at the same time, and it's challenging. Will it be more efficient to love and teach at different times? So, so you've got a daughter who makes excuses. And, and you, let's say she hasn't done a responsibility. And so you teach her what her responsibility is again. And she makes an excuse. You need to read the parenting book. Because in the parenting book, you're going to find dozens of examples of what to say to a child when the child makes excuses. That book's just filled with little examples. And so you say, like, for example, the child says, uh, here's a common one. Uh, did you uh, take out the garbage? I forgot. And you say, there's no upset. This is the key. This is the biggest thing. Because the instant you're upset, it's I don't love you. So you say, let's see. You forgot. Um, do you ever forget your birthday? Do you ever forget that it's supper time? Do you ever forget uh, what time school is over? No, never. They don't ever forget those things. So you remember all the things you want to do. Is that right? All the things you like. And you don't remember the things you don't want to do. So really the truth is you didn't want to take out the garbage. That would be the real truth. What, am I right? So that they can see the truth of the thing and still feel loved by you. So you just keep persisting in that. Now one thing that will help your daughter not feel punished by the consequences, and again read the parenting book because it will teach you about how to do consequences, is if she has some uh, role in choosing them. So you teach her, you say, now so if you don't do a particular task then the idea is simply to motivate you to do the task. Do you have an idea about what would be a great way to motivate you to do the task, other than to pay you a million dollars? And you and, and you come up with a list. You say, well, let's see, here would be one. We could do this. Uh, we could do this. Like, for example, the garbage. Um, we had a more than one child who didn't like to do the garbage. 
And so we would say, let's see, so if you don't do the garbage, we could do this. Um, if you don't have the garbage done by 6 o'clock, you don't eat supper. So that would be one consequence. If you don't do the garbage, you could sleep outside with the garbage. That would be one. Uh, another consequence would be that we could take all the garbage in the house and dump it on your bed. That would help you remember to do the garbage. That's, that's another option. Um, another would be that if you don't do the garbage, then you would have to also do your sister's laundry for three days. Um, we came up with a list of you know, half a dozen different things, different consequences. Now, which of these would you like? So that they have a role in choosing the consequence. And then what you say is, I would prefer that you didn't ever have any of these consequences. It would be much easier if you just simply took the garbage out. But that's your choice. So do you understand that if you choose not to take out the garbage, you are choosing to, whatever this consequence is, sleep outside with the garbage or uh, not eat supper, whatever it is. You understand you're making that choice, not me. That's not my choice. It's your choice. And nobody will feel mad at you and nobody will feel sorry for you because that's a choice you're making. You're saying, yeah, I'd like to sleep out in the garbage, out with, out with the garbage tonight, or I want to miss supper, or whatever it is. Um, so that's your choice. You're entirely in charge of your own life. And then when the consequence comes, you don't say, oh, see, I told you, now you have to go out and sleep with the garbage. No, you just say, well, so you, you know what's next. When the consequence follows with no irritation and they had a part in choosing it, they tend to feel a whole lot less like it was a punishment. No kidding. Um, Kathy, today I was giving attention to the 12-year-old and the 13-year-old started whining. I sort of ignored her at first, but then I went and explained to her that even if I gave her some attention, attention uh, or sympathy, that she wouldn't be able to feel it. She got it. Oh my goodness sakes, that's so cool. Because she's been working on real love with me too. It was neat. Uh, people say to me, well, do young kids, do, do young kids or teenagers understand these principles? Absolutely. Sure they do. And it's easy to illustrate. You say, so if I come up to you and you grab them by the shirt and you jerk them and you say, if I say, come with me right now, and you come, is that going to feel fulfilling for either of us? No. And that's what happens when we whine or complain or do anything to get attention. We turn it into trash. So it can only feel like love if it's given freely. As soon as we control it, we ruin it. And kids get it. By age 12, they get it easily. <clears throat> Sarah says, uh, do you have any suggestions on how to help uh, Jasmine, who's one, get through some separation anxiety. Last week I joined the gym, which is wonderful because I get to go and work out three times a week. And also because uh, Yasmin gets to, Yasmin or Jasmine gets to play with other small kids in the kids club. I assume that's probably at the gym. The first time I left her there, she was fine. The second time she was fine when I left uh, the room. But the caregivers told me that she wanted to be held for most of the time. The third time she was fine, but cried if she wasn't held. When I went again on Monday, she was fine when I left the room. It started to scream after about five minutes and kept on screaming for over an hour until I returned. Huh, that's a drag. Uh, I have to say I'm concerned about leaving her again, but I do want for both of them to be comfortable going to the gym. All right, there's a lot of different things you can do for separation anxiety, and you're going to have to come up with your own little thing, but like, it's different at age five than it is at age one. But like, for example, um, at age one, you could, for example, have some pictures. You can take some pictures, your husband can take some pictures of you and the child together. Uh, you know, a little, I don't know, three by five, four by six pictures uh, that you laminate. And then when you leave her in the nursery, you leave her with the picture. So that then whoever's taking care of her says, see, here's mommy mommy with you and mommy will be back shortly. Um, 
that's a big thing. The kid is reminded that there you are instead of just poof, you're gone. Um, so having a picture of you and the child in the picture is a big help. Uh, another one would be, let's say that there's a favorite story, a book that she likes to, to have read. Um, you know, one of the Dr. Zeus books or some such thing, or a favorite um, song that she likes to have sung. Record it. Um, there are really cheap little digital recorders now um, that for, I don't know, 60 bucks or something, you can make a digital recording of you singing the song or reading the story, and then uh, with a computer, uh, you can make a CD of it and put it in a cheap $12 Walkman. And then when you leave, um, she can hold the picture, she can play the song, there you are. Uh, there's a picture of you and you're singing to her or reading to her and you have the little book there and shoot, there's mama. Uh, there's all kinds of things you can do to create essentially you being there with the child. She might get to where she likes the Walkman better than you, who knows. Lots of parenting questions tonight, huh? Anybody else? I was at a, uh, a group meeting tonight, and uh, right here in my hometown, which has been going on for several months now, and uh, I hadn't been there for some time. I try not to go to to groups very often because it uh, kind of impedes the growth of leadership there. But uh, it was really gratifying to see the growth of the people there in the two or three months since I'd been there. There was one man who, uh, the last time I was there, was just seething with anger. He was angry at his wife. He was angry at the world. He was angry at the government. I mean, one of the things that his wife was so furious at him about was that he would watch the news every night and then stomp and fume for an hour or two afterwards, cursing all of the stupid things that the government does. And he looked like a different person. He had learned to tell the truth about himself. Uh, he was more. He was more. He was calmer. He was more peaceful. Uh, real love really does melt monsters. It was pretty fun to see. Uh, and in the course of the conversation, he said something like, "Well, you know, I've, I've changed a little bit, you know, with real love." And I said, "Back up. You've changed a lot. You may not have noticed much of the difference because you live with yourself every day, but." I haven't seen you in two or three months, and uh, it's been a huge difference. It's fun to see. Here's a man who says, uh, my unconscious behaviors are still dogging me. Uh, it's so easy for them to jump out. My mother was watching my son while I hit golf balls with my father. After an hour and more, we came home to my son crying. I knew that he had skipped his nap but he just kept crying. And I noticed the time and I said to my mother, I assume, uh, have you fed him yet? What do you mean you haven't fed him? It's almost 7.30, no wonder he's crying. He eats at six. My mother said she didn't know when he ate. About 10 minutes went by and I apologized to my mother for my actions. <laughs> Before uh, I left, I should have noticed the time and let my mom know when he ate and even set out some food for her to give him while I was out having fun. I then told her that this type of behavior is just what I'm working on and that someday soon I hope that I can get to the point where this doesn't happen. That is just, that's, an, that's a miracle. Because, you know, w when we feel bad, see you got home, here's your son crying, you're feeling helpless, you're feeling stupid, it's your fault, the kid's feeling bad, here you've starved your own son to death and Rather than take the responsibility on yourself, the first impulse is we like to lash out at other people and blame somebody else. Nobody likes to say, 
uh, it's all my fault. I was a bad father. Uh, so your first impulse was to lash out, but you got over it. And then you came back and said, um, my bad, my mistake, uh, and this is what I'm learning to work on. That's just a miracle. That, that's, that's all that could ever be asked of us is that we identify our mistakes and we'll make them less. As time goes by, we really will. Um, Sarah says, I'm not a Catholic and never have been to confession, but I was thinking as I was nursing Yasmin that calling a real love friend and telling the truth must be somewhat similar to going to confession. You know, in some respects, it probably is. Uh, you know, it's, it's all about saying, here's who I am, and then feeling it accepted and loved. You're not really looking for absolution or forgiveness. Love is better than forgiveness. So yeah, there are some similarities to that and, and kind of a similar sense of freedom too. There at the group tonight, there was also a, uh, a couple that as recently as, oh, probably a week ago, both he and she uh, had each on separate occasions about a week ago said, that's it, I'm done, I don't ever want to see him or her again. Their marriage was over. They were going to get divorced, they were finished, I'm fed up. And with just, with just a little help, with just a little insight, with just a little bit of loving from the outside and seeing their partner differently, uh, they were unrecognizable at group. Uh, I gave the husband a couple of hints uh, about how he could handle an argument differently when they started to get angry. And his, <laughs> and his wife came up to me a couple of days later and said, did you teach him to do that? <laughs> I said, what? She said, we were having an argument and he was starting to get angry and he crossed the room and she said she started to get nervous because he's hit her in the past. And he crossed the room, she said, and he came up to me and he put his nose right up to my nose. And he said, I'm a moron. I'm being selfish and unloving. Please forgive me. And she said she just fell apart laughing. I mean, the argument was over. That was exactly what I suggested he do. It's, you know, I've, I've, I've tell groups of both men and women, men and women both think that what women want, the three words that women want to hear more than any others are, I love you. And that's not true. The three words that women want to hear more than any others are, I was wrong. Because I love you doesn't mean very much. Uh, you're in the middle of an argument and you're being hateful and angry and you say, well, but I, but I still love you. Well, now, what does that mean? You're still going to do whatever it was you were doing again because you don't recognize what you were doing. Whereas if you say to your partner, I was wrong and let me show you how I was wrong. If you can do that, the odds of your repeating your mistake go down a lot. Whereas just, I was, I love you or I was, I'm sorry. What does that mean? I'm sorry often just means, gee, I, I hate it that you're mad at me. And if I say I'm sorry, will you not be mad at me? I was wrong. That, that's really an icebreaker. It really kind of breaks up uh, any kind of conflict. Kathy says, I'm finding that my work with real love has brought up so much personal growth. Because I'm looking at what I do wrong, I'm dealing with some pretty deep issues. Ah, no kidding. The truth I keep coming up against is this feeling of worthlessness. I can logically see how I got this from my upbringing and the conditional love and the perfection from my parents, but it still keeps showing up as the source of a lot of my unloving actions. Any suggestions? Yeah, you feel worthless because you feel like you could have done better. You, pe people keep saying to themselves, I should have something. So my question to you is, looking back at the mistakes that you made a year ago, two years ago, 10 years ago, with the knowledge you had 
then could you have made wiser choices? Now, knowing what you know now, oh, I got it. Knowing what you know now, you could have done better. But it is just impossible for you to have known then what you know now. That can't be done. So, sure, if you knew then what you know now, that would be very cool. But that's not possible. So knowing what you knew then, could you have made better choices? No. So what are you feeling guilty about? In fact, you are doing then exactly what you were trained to do. In fact, you should be congratulated. You are executing perfectly the training of people who trained you to do it, unfortunately, the wrong way. So how can you be faulted? It would be just like if I train somebody to play the piano and I train them to play a particular passage wrong and they learned it wrong perfectly. Well, then who should be blamed? Them? Should they feel guilty? No, they simply learned it wrong from an imperfect teacher. And that's what you did. So feeling guilty, what a waste. So you can wallow in that if you want. Uh, if, but if you can show me a single positive use for that, uh, let me know. Or you can move on and simply learn to be more loving and fill your life with happiness. Gee, that seems kind of like a no-brainer. And we're not talking about glossing it over. No, no. When I talk about the mistakes I made with my children or with anybody else, I made them. I hurt them. I caused pain. We're not minimizing our mistakes at all. But how could I have done better? So we're simply telling the truth. We're not thinking positive and we're not blowing them off. Clear? Is it reasonable to limit the amount of money my 10-year-old takes to the movies to buy junk food, even if it's his own money? It feels irresponsible for me to not limit his junk food at all. <laughs> if, if it's his money, the whole reason for him to have his money is for him to learn what to do with it. And so we learn from making our own choices. That's the purpose for children having an allowance. It's the purpose for them increasingly making their own choices is that's how they figure stuff out. So that when my kids were like eight or so, we would say, uh, okay, now you get to keep your room however you want it. Uh, up until eight, you know, we made them keep their room clean because you yeah, kind of ought to know what one looks like. But after that, do what you want. And once they got to be 10, 11, 12, it varied from child to child, you get to set your own bedtime. And their, their friends would be going, you're kidding. You get to go to bed whenever you want? Mm -hmm. Because every child had to, had to, of course, test the limit, and they would stay up all night. But then... See, not only do you get to set your own bedtime, but you also have to show up at the family meeting at 6.30 in the morning. So every kid who tested this would show up at the family meeting going, oh, that was too late. And of course, the other kids would just tease them. Or they'd go to school, and they'd come home going, I can't stay up that late anymore. Well, see, they learned the lesson. And they learned the lesson from their own experience. Instead of me saying, you know, you shouldn't stay up too late. Now what did they learn? Um, you don't stay up too late. Why? Because dad tells you so. That's not exactly a useful lesson to carry through life. They need to learn the real reasons you don't stay up too late. Because you can't stay awake. That's the reason. So this kid needs to learn, uh, why do you not spend all your money on candy? Um, well, it makes you sick. Um, because then your money's gone and you can't spend it on anything else, any number of reasons. But they're not going to learn that lesson if we limit it for them. So, no, I, I, you know, it's obviously up to you, it's, uh, not my family. But I would say, you say to the kid, uh, it's your money, do what you want to with it. But then later when the kid says, I have no money to spend it on a baseball glove or whatever, you go, oh, well, hmm. What did you spend it on? You just ask. And he goes, I don't know. You say, well, let's see. There was that movie candy, do you remember? 
and then there was that you just help them see where it went so that they can see the relative costs and benefits of how they spend their money. Whereas if we control them, they, their behavior is just about pleasing us. That's worthless. Jill says, I've been uh, showing my irritations to my daughters many times. They know that I'm practicing real love. They like that. Uh, I used to think that, I, that if I apologized once, it's enough. <laughs> <laughs> we've made mistakes with our kids thousands of times. And so we really have to tell the truth about our mistakes quite a few times before our kids are going to believe it. It's not like we can sit down with them once and go, you know, I've made some mistakes with you as a parent and I'm sorry about those and then you're done. Um, no, you get to do that a bunch of times. Hearing other people's examples, she says, I think I need to do, I need to more often tell the truth about myself to my kids every time. Absolutely. Uh, every time you become irritated at them, when you realize it, even if it's an hour later, five minutes later, you come back and go, hey, it, I was wrong. That doesn't mean the child was right. You know, they may still have to go wash the dishes or whatever it is. But you go, the way I just spoke to you, mm -mm, inexcusable. That was, that was a mistake. So guys, it's been another just uh, hoot of an evening. I've just loved every minute of it. So thanks for coming. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Bring your friends and your popcorn. And uh, remember until then that it's always about real love. Good to be with you.